Porn stars embody the sexual ideals of gay men. It is the porn star's sexual performance that is the portal through which viewers engage with the pornographic movie. Director Fred Halstead considered hardcore porn a performer's medium as well as the cameraman's. When filmmaker Fred Halstead was alive, nobody really knew what to make of him. Fred Halstead was in all senses a pornographer, but more an experimentalist who was heavily influenced by a friend and underground filmmaker Kenneth Anger and whose films, unlike many of the erotic gay films that were released in the early days, were rough, dark, and extreme. He went on to make ambitious and experimental films that included some of the first visual examples of fisting and would garner critical acclaim for his work during his lifetime. Of all of Fred Halstead's taboo-shattering gay porn films, L.A. plays itself, his initial film is his grand opus. Although the film is not considered a masterpiece in any conventional way, it is beloved by Halstead fans and art critics as it broke new ground while the groundwork was being laid in gay erotic cinema. On tonight's episode, we celebrate L.A. Plays Itself, Fred Halstead's notorious autobiographical portrait of Los Angeles that some have called Boys in the Sand's evil cousin. This gritty and highly edited piece of work sent a shockwave throughout the fledging gay liberation movement and the art establishment. Whenever you think of Fred Halstead from this moment on, you will come to associate him with Joey Yale. Yale's iconic performance in L.A. plays itself as a fisting bottom would begin a friendship, partnership, and tumultuous relationship with Halstead that would tie them together forever in history. The BDSM twink of your dreams, who was a model and filmmaker during the early 1970s, who tamed and tried to control an artist like Fred Halstead. On this episode, we celebrate Fred Halstead, his film L.A. Plays Itself, and Joey Yale. This is Demystifying Gay Porn. My name is Ike Grande. And if you watch gay porn, I've definitely helped to get off. Before we continue, I want to remind you to help this channel by clicking the subscribe button and selecting the bell icon for notifications to see more content like this. Every little bit helps, and I appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Fred Halstead. The gay movie, in less than five years, has become an art form in American cinema. Let's turn on with some of the best shots in the lot. Fred Charles Halstead was born in Long Beach, California in 1941 to his parents Milton William Halstead, a construction worker with roots in the railroad industry, and his mother Lillian Halstead, an agricultural worker, and Dukabor. The Dukabor, or spirit wrestlers, were a religious sect with origins in Russia hundreds of years ago. Much of the Dukabor group's history is riddled with inaccuracies due to their resistance to put anything in writing, including their own history, relying on oral tradition. Lillian and Milton married in 1936 and had two sons, Milton and Fred. In 1944, Milton would abandon his family. Halstead described his mother as a hustler who struggled to support her children. Lillian would later remarry a fellow Dukabor from her hometown. Halstead's stepfather would make an acceptable husband, but an abusive stepfather of Fred. Halstead has gone on to say that he was raped by his stepfather. Halstead recounted his experience to a friend. He would put up a struggle, but ultimately he had to surrender. Halstead described it as a turning point in his identity when he realized he had the power to sexually terrify other men. He really didn't like sex, but he liked the power behind it. Halstead attended school in Bakersfield, California, and studied botany at Cal State, becoming a gardener for clients like Joey Heatherton and Vincent Price, a time he considers the happiest of his life. In 1969, Halstead took a break from gardening and began to film porn loops that were shown in East Los Angeles. It is at this point that Halstead decided to make an autobiographical homosexual story. Halstead was not classically taught. He didn't have a regular job. He didn't shoot commercials or videos. He didn't even have a social security number. But what he did have was an eye for L.A. His first film, L.A. Plays Itself, was shot over a period of three years and was almost instantly regarded as a classic in the gay porn genre. When it was released, L.A. Played Itself made Halstead the kind of celebrity that doesn't exist today. With his newfound underground fame, Halstead planned on making another film and making it a crossover into mainstream. 
the two following films would be known as Halstead's L.A. Sex Trilogy. Halstead made Sex Garage next, a 35-minute black and white short that was after L.A. plays itself and intended to accompany it at screenings. Shot in a garage in the Hollywood Hills over the span of six hours, Sex Garage mixes an array of visual overtures like Sunset Strip, Billboards, Bunny, Soap Suds on Body Hair, and Water Flowing Down the Drain in a Shower. Calendars and girly magazines found in the sort of garage where older generation of mechanics did their work. Sex Garage defied genre conventions as embryonic as they were in the gay porn of 1972, but did so in ways different from L.A. plays itself. The straight sex between the flower children or hippies, often shown in macroscopic detail, casually introduces bisexuality in a gay porn film long before the bisexual genre became fashionable during the early 1990s. For his next film, Halstead made Sex Tool, exploring a fantasy Los Angeles populated by policemen, boxers, leathermen, a sailor, and one straight man squiring for his Amerasian transgender paramour. I've got a one-hander for you to entertain right here. Again? We've been dead for hours and hours. Who's keeping score? I fuck you so hard and deep, you shouldn't even be able to walk. At the time, Sex Tool was one of the most explicit films meant for general release. What Halstead ended up presenting was an even more avant-garde piece than the last two offerings, held together by dialogue. Mainstream theaters were not keen on picking up the film. The only other option was the porn circuit, but many of the porn theaters were not equipped to handle a 35mm film. In the end, Sex Tool received limited distribution. To Halstead, the film was sexually political. He establishes visual dialogue between intense BDSM sequences, including some with his lover Joey Yale, and a trans woman and drag queens at an upscale party. After the Museum of Modern Art screened Halstead's work, they acquired three prints of all three films and lent his work a distinction he seldom forgot. After the commercial failure of Sex Tool, Halstead began to write and started his own magazine, Package, which ran six issues. There, he would revel in self-expression and extreme sexual liberation. Halstead was very schooled in politics and gay sexuality. He was not able to mount another project, as ambitious as Sex Tool again, but he was still a star. Halstead starred in films for other studios and filmmakers including Eroticus, directed by Tom DeSimone, and Joe Gage's El Paso Wrecking Corps, part of a trilogy of gay films about the proletariat man. In 1979, Halstead, along with his romantic partner and business partner Joey Yale, brought the play News for Tennessee to the stage. Halstead starred as a hustler in the play, which he performed at the Pilot Theater in Los Angeles. It was mildly received. When Halstead returned to directing in the 1980s, many of the films were forgettable, with the exception of A Night at Halstead's, which stood out on its own as a return to form, though he never again made a film with the originality and raw energy of his L.A. Sex Trilogy. A Night at Halstead's was shot at a club Fred Halstead briefly owned with business partner David Webb and Joseph Yale in the early 1980s. Halstead's was a raw industrial space transformed into something Halstead called a stand-up fuck club. Halstead's included a trailer of an 18-wheeler simulating the trucks of New York City's meatpacking district, a plexiglass wall with a glory hole, and a set of bunk beds with no mattresses. The club's life was short-lived, as Halstead would go on to note there weren't enough perverts in Los Angeles to support the business he envisioned. Joey Yale was a frequent collaborator of Halstead's who he met outside of a bar, Falcon's Lair, at 19. He was too young to get into the club at the time, but that meeting would lead to a romantic partnership as well as a business relationship when they opened their studio, Costco, under which they released their own titles. Joey Yale and Halstead had a tumultuous relationship and would part ways and sell their films to his video in 1984. Around this time, Joey became sick with AIDS and would pass away in 1986. Halstead was an emotional wreck following Joey Yale's death. He was without an anchor and drowned himself in alcohol. 
He was also financially destitute. He was losing his struggle to alcohol and drugs. He received help from his brother, who allowed him to stay at an apartment he owned in Orange County in exchange for maintenance and gardening work. On May 9, 1989, at the age of 47, Fred Halstead would commit suicide by overdosing on sleeping pills in that same apartment. His suicide note would read, I wanted to be with Joey. I am a has-been, and now I can't get anything produced. I am broke and can't get a job in my field. My skin is fouled up. I've had a good life. I've had looks, a body, money, success, and artistic triumphs. I've had the love of my life. I see no reason to go on. Who edited this? Is anybody coming? Doing? Turn around. I'll take down my pants. Hurry up really quick. Fast, fast. No cars. All right. Oh, Jesus. You're not going to put this in the film. Fire the editor. If you put this in the film, I'm going to sue. At the end of his life, Halstead wrote an autobiography called Why I Did It. He intended to have it published, but a porn publisher named George Mavady rejected it saying it was unpublishable. Halstead's hopes were dashed. The only copy of the book was never seen again, but is supposedly in the hands of one of his close friends. We may never really know why he did it, why Fred Halstead would pursue a career in gay porn. During his lifetime, an openly gay filmmaker had no hope of making gay films in the industry. Being free enough to make sex films seemed not only possible, but necessary. Fred Halstead refused to engage in any rules of the game. Halstead took advantage of a window of opportunity that would inevitably leave him behind. As porn became the juggernaut it is today, it lost all of its creativity and personality for safe and formulaic. You can still find Halstead's work online, but most of his films have fallen out of distribution. However, Fred Halstead does have the distinct honor of having his L.A. sex trilogy be the only gay pornographic movies in the permanent collection at the Museum of Modern Art. Fun fact, L.A. plays itself divided viewers and critics upon its release due to its non-narrative storyline as well as its far-out visuals. It was so wild at that time that surrealist painter Salvatore Dali attended the screening and was quoted as saying, New information for me. Fred Halstead began making his film in 1969 while still in the closet. He was 27 and had become a landscape gardener. While working one day, it began to rain. Not able to do anything during the rain, Halstead would stay home, smoke a few joints, and think about his life. That is when he realized he had something to say about sexuality and his personal interest in sadism. Sadism is defined as the tendency to derive pleasure, especially sexual gratification, from inflicting pain, suffering, or humiliation of others. L.A. Plays Itself was written before Stonewall, but filmed after the event had generated commemorating marches in several cities, including Los Angeles. Halstead rejected the linear structure common to both the liberationist political narrative about coming out and the new pornographic films that featured a meeting, sex, and a leaving. L.A. Plays Itself is a film on violence and urban squalor featuring hustlers and vagrants that reveal the city of angels' dark side. L.A. Plays Itself begins with a shot of a sign that appears at the city limits of Los Angeles. The population figure listed, 2 million, 535,700 recalls a distant era of the city's growth. The scene changes to the mists of Malibu Canyon, an unlikely oasis at the edge of a metropolitan area. In voiceover, we hear a fragment of a conversation between Halstead and a man with an accent that identifies him as a former resident of Philadelphia or Baltimore. The man utters the words, Los Angeles stinks and Fred defends his city by saying that the place is filling up with New Yorkers. As the dialogue fades, we hear Japanese koto music, and nature shots take over the visuals. A lone hiker pauses at a stream, 
where we meet a naked blonde man who offers to give him head. They are interrupted by shots of approaching bulldozers, surely a critique on the city's economic growth and destruction of natural beauty. The second half of L.A. plays itself grows a bit darker. We see an older man seducing and violating a younger, innocent-looking guy. This sequence has commonly been referred to as a dramatization of how Fred Halstead's affair with Joey Yale began. Voiceover dialogue introduces the younger guy as a cowboy hustler, newly arrived from Texas, eager to mess around with Halstead, whom we hear and see in the picture. Halstead offers to show him the robes, and things get quite literal very quickly. Yale's character is bound, beaten, and kicked, and at the climax of the movie, fisted. Yale did indeed get fisted, however he did not finish the scene, and the lack of footage in the editing room forced Fred Halstead to shoot more material with a man who might be called a stunt butt. Also, the voice we hear in the film didn't belong to Yale's either. This final scene was cut out of home video distribution due to the attention it would draw from law enforcement for featuring extreme hardcore. Detractors of the film were extremely upset because they felt the filmed fisting scene was exaggerated and could be reenacted by home viewers with dire consequences. Viewers be warned. If you didn't know any better, and there weren't full-on penetrative anal sex scenes involving two men, you would confuse L.A. Plays itself with a surreal, avant-garde documentary film. The film is less linear than many viewers and analysts try to make it out to be. It is absolutely experimental and in the vein of Kenneth Anger. From the beautiful outdoor scenery to the documentary-style grit of early 1970s Los Angeles, I can see how people in the industry really didn't know what to make of this film. In his book Role Models, John Waters uses the term outsider porn to describe auteurs, amateurs, and genius created outside of the boundaries of porn. Fred Halstead fits this description very well. The reason so many viewers and critics at the time had a hard time placing this movie was its highlighting of the sadomasochistic lifestyle it celebrates. Just as with many movements, the gay liberation movement was making strides and did not want what they considered a poor or unfavorable depiction of what it means to be gay. The discourse was just starting. Kenneth Anger had just given the world Scorpio Rising, and Tom DeSimone had just documented a study on s and culture by way of signature films. And here comes Fred Halstead busting the door down. The disinterest in the penis and in penetration as a mechanism of orgasm in s and meant that full intercourse, if present, is incidental in these movies. But s and was already becoming tamed and commercialized by leathermen who sported the look but did not fully participate in the intellectual considerations Halstead hoped were part of genuine s and The city that LA plays itself makes available to us only exists at this point in time in history. To try and reconstruct the LA that Halstead knew would be like imagining another world. LA plays itself occupies a place in pornography without delivering what we all have come to expect from a typical porn film. As author William E. Jones says in his book, Halstead Plays Himself, a film so naive and urgent could never be made again. L.A. Plays Itself made Fred Halstead gay porn's first altar, using sex acts as a way to break down boundaries and have a revealing conversation about sadomasochism among other so-called perverts. By the time you see the now infamous fisting scene at the end of the film, any boundaries that existed when you started the film are gone. It is still revealing. Fun fact, Halstead lent his talent to a film called Eroticus by Tom DeSimone. In this film, which featured L.A. plays itself heavily, Halstead alleged that DeSimone changed the ending of the film's highlight to a shot of a 1969 L.A. Times headline reading, New Weird Cult Linked to Tate Murder. Halstead believed this slight revision alluded to the fisting scene ending of his film being associated with the Manson family's torture and killing spree. He called DeSimone's addition a comment on a subculture he does not agree with, but Halstead enthusiastically embraced. For that reason, Fred Halstead denounced Eroticus.
Joey Yale was born Joseph Richard Janoska in Lynch, Kentucky on December 25, 1949. His parents would eventually move to Speedway, Indiana, home of the Indianapolis 500. There, he attended high school and was a part of the theater program. Check out his classmate. Yep, that's Joey Stewart from Three's Company. Yale had an older brother who was a locally known bluegrass singer and eventually left for Los Angeles to find fame and fortune. Joey would go with him and travel a few days to get to California. When they arrived with only $100 in their pocket, they soon began working day jobs while pursuing a life in entertainment. His brother Michael would eventually record an album for Epic Records and later worked as a composer and guitarist with stars like Johnny Cash and Glenn Campbell. Yale's path was not so straightforward. He began his entertainment career in the original Disney on Parade traveling roadshow. Yale would play the role of Mowgli, the Jungle Boy. And during this time, he would ditch his birth name of Janoska for Janacek, before finally being given his name Joey Yale by Henry Wilson, the legendary former manager of Tab Hunter and Rock Hudson. Joey Yale met Fred Halstead outside of a leather bar in West Hollywood in 1969. They became romantically involved, and Fred would convince Yale to star in his first porn film, L.A. Plays Itself. Yale, who had previously performed in Leather Narcissist, filmed most of his work, but halfway through the film, he quit the project for fear of hurting the career he wanted to pursue. Fred and Yale parted ways at that point in time. Several years later, they rekindled their friendship and relationship and went on to work on more films, eventually becoming business partners with a studio called Costco. They also lived together in an apartment in West Hollywood. Their relationship was troubled and volatile, with people going on record saying it was on again, off again. And while everyone assumed Fred was the big bulking top, he was very passive. When they had arguments, Yale would clobber him, and Fred would show up at a friend's house bloodied up. Sometimes their relationship was purely out of necessity. Fred admitted that he had no sense of business and was relieved when Yale took over managing all of their affairs. Fred and Yale's company Costco distributed and in most cases produced 24 gay pornographic films between 1973 and 1985. Yale was not prolific as a performer, starring in only a handful of titles. In fact, he directed more titles than he performed in. Yale was great at the business aspect of the business, and later the storylines, scripts, set design, lighting, directing, acting, marketing, and distribution. In 1975, Fred Halstead proposed to Yale. The announcement of the imminent marriage was given to newspapers, but later the pair decided to remain partners and called marriage heteronormative. Yale tired of his domestic situation and left Fred in the early 1980s. In 1984, Fred and Yale sold the distribution rights of all of their films, including L.A. Plays Itself and Sex Garage, to His Video, a subsidiary of Video Company of America. L.A. Plays Itself was released on VHS by VCA in 1990 and did not include the final fisting scene. Anybody who wasn't living under a rock in the 1970s knew legendary porn actor John Holmes, who was known for his huge penis. For those of you in younger generations, John Holmes was the inspiration for the films Boogie Nights and Wonderland. When Holmes fell on harder times, he turned to making a couple of gay porn films. In July 1983, Yale performed with John Holmes in The Private Pleasures of John C. Holmes. John Holmes would later die of AIDS on March 13, 1988. While there is speculation online about whether this was the scene where John Holmes contracted HIV, it really is all speculation, as there is no way to know what the private lives of these models were off production. In 1984, Yale was ill with AIDS, something Fred was incapable of dealing with. While visiting Yale at the hospital, Yale once shouted at Fred, You did this to me. Yale's brother, Michael, was at his side the entire time and did not have a nice thing to say about Fred, whom he accused of abandoning Yale during his time of need. On April 18, 1986, Joseph Richard Yanoska, Joey Yale, died in his home in Palm Springs, California. He was cremated 
and his ashes were spread on a hill overlooking the town of Palm Springs, the place he loved. As with many of the subjects in these shorts, it was very hard to find detailed information on Joey Yale. I have to thank William E. Jones, whose book Halstead Plays Himself, does the best job of gathering any and all information about Fred Halstead and Joey Yale. History from this moment and before has been less kind to Joey Yale than his more infamous counterpart Fred Halstead. Aesthetically, nothing really distinguishes Yale as an auteur, but he was still there and still the backbone of a famous, difficult man. Joey Yale leaves a roster of films he appeared in that are now since iconic, and a roster of films he has directed that surely deserve a second look. Fun fact. We all know by this point what the term twink is referring to. We may disagree on whether it is an acronym or not, but did you know that Fred Halstead and Joey Yale claim to have invented the term twink and say it derives from Twinkie snacks? Their belief was that Twinkies or Twinks were white, sickingly sweet, full of cream, and had no nutritional value whatsoever. You've been watching Demystifying Gay Porn. I am your host, Ike Grande. Demystifying Gay Porn can be found on every podcast directory, as well as YouTube. Demystifying Gay Porn is on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Telegram, Discord, And if you like what you're watching and want to be a part of the process, head over to patreon.com backslash demystifying gay porn, where you can help support this channel and I can continue making content like this. Once again, this is demystifying gay porn. My name is Ike Grande. And if you watch gay porn, I've definitely helped to get off. Cheers. (laughs) 